Hi, my name is Bill Kinney. I'm a math professor at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this is the first of a series of videos that I'm making about complex analysis. I am using this for a class called Topics in Math, where we're doing complex analysis, but maybe you're using this for an actual complex analysis course. This is a in first of a sub-series focused on complex arithmetic methods and geometric interpretations. Uh, so this is this is the basics here. What's going to distinguish my video series compared to some other series that you might find is that I am going to focus also on using Mathematica, teaching you Mathematica along with the complex analysis as we go. I'm going to be following, relatively uh, speaking, the Fundamentals of Complex Analysis by E.D. Saff and A.D. Snyder, the third edition of that book. I mean, the topics are pretty standard as it, as it is, but that's the book that I'm using for the class that I'm teaching, and I will be mostly following these sections in that book. So let's start it off. How do, where do we start? We start with something called the imaginary unit, um, symbolized by the letter I. In Mathematica, if you want to uh, get a special symbol, a special I for the imaginary unit, what you do is you press the escape button. So I'm doing that right now. You can watch me here. You can press the escape button and then do two eyes in a row, and then press the escape button again, and it magically turns into sort of a special looking eye here. Let me zoom in so we can see it. It's sort of a, sometimes called a double struck eye, sort of an extra line in there. That's the imaginary unit, and what is it? The imaginary unit is the number with the property that it is, well, we call it the square root of negative one. But you might ask, and this is what happened historically, how can such a thing exist? How can we have a square root of a negative number? Because we know that when we square any number, any real number to be a little bit more precise, we always get a non-negative number, a number greater than or equal to zero. So this was kind of suspect, and that's the historical reason it was called an imaginary number is because people said, well, you're just making it up. There is no such number. But it turned out over the, over the course of hundreds of years that people started to slowly realize that this imaginary unit was actually useful for solving real life problems, as we ultimately will see. So it gained acceptance because it was helpful for solving real life problems, even though in the real number system, there is no such number whose square root of is negative one. By the way, engineers sometimes call it J instead of I because they use I for current. But um, we're going to use the standard letter I for it. In Mathematica, what I just showed you in Mathematica is I, I type this in a cell. Notice this blue line over here on the right. Uh, this is text mode here. If you go up to format and look under style, you'll see a check by the word text. We are in text mode here. If I want to get Mathematica to do computations to represent the imaginary unit I internally, I need to make sure I'm in input mode and I can get to input mode by clicking between blue lines, for example, underneath this one, until I see a horizontal line going across the the uh, notebook here. And if I do that, if I go back to format and style, I will see I am in input mode. That tells you Mathematica is ready to take some input. And I will go ahead and type in some input here. First of all, I'll just type in escape, two eyes, escape again. And if I enter this, Mathematica will spit back at me what I entered. Um, and there's two ways to enter it. If you've got a big long keyboard, you can with with the number with number buttons on the right side you can just hit the enter key on the far right side of the keyboard but most people don't have such a long keyboard so most people have to use shift return press the shift button and return make sure your cursor is on this line and it spit back at me what i typed in it also happened to spit back at me in 7 and out 7 that's that means input 7 and output 7 well actually what, I'm, what, what that means is I was doing some things on Mathematica before I showed you this. If I just opened Mathematica for the first time, it would show in one and out one. 
but I did some things already before showing this to you. You can also, a little bit more quickly, just enter the imaginary unit in Mathematica with a capital I. If you again do shift return now, that is the uh, imaginary unit I. It's written as a capital I. You might wonder, philosophically speaking, do imaginary numbers really exist? And, well, mathematicians don't have any problems with that because mathematicians define imaginary numbers to exist and they define them in such a way that you can add and multiply them in very consistent ways that are very useful actually and beautiful and that's what we hope to see. So there's no problem with philosophy for us here. What is the form of a complex number? I'll write the general form here. The, a complex number is a number that takes the form a plus b times the imaginary unit i, where a and b, a and b are real numbers, regular numbers, regular decimals we might call them. They are elements of the real number system. I'm going to do a little extra here. If I press escape, el escape, I get a, an, is an element of symbol. And if I press escape, ds capital R escape, I get a double struct R, which represents the real number system. So complex numbers involve the imaginary unit in this special way. You create a complex number by taking A, a real number, plus B, another real number, times the imaginary unit I. That kind of expression is called a complex number. And um, A is called, a little bit more terminology here, A is, a is called the real part of the complex number. B is called the imaginary part of the complex number. Both the real part and the imaginary part of a complex number are actually real numbers, even though the second one's called the imaginary part. B is the imaginary part, not BI. The imaginary part of A plus BI is just the B. How do you add complex numbers? Well, you treat them as if they are just expressions involving a variable in a sense. Treat the i as if it's like an x. And we've got two binomials here in this variable, so to speak, i. And you just add like terms. So for example, what I have here is the complex number 3 plus 2i, and I'm adding to it the complex number 4 plus 5i. What are the like terms? There's the real parts, the 3 and the 4, those should add together to give you 7. There's the parts with the i, the 2i and the 5i. The imaginary part of this complex number is just the 2. The imaginary part of this complex number is just the 5. But you do add the 2i and the 5i to get what you would think you would get. You get 7i. And I'll enter this in Mathematica, and it will spit back the answer as 7 plus 7i. 3 plus 4 is 7. 2 plus 5 is 7. Let's just make it a different example just so we something a little different. It's 3 plus 4 is 7, so you get the 7 there. The real part of the answer is 7. 6 plus 5 is 11. The imaginary part of the answer is 11. You write the answer as 7 plus 11i. So in general, with complex addition, you could write the general rule for how to add complex numbers like this. Add the real parts, and it becomes the real part of your answer. Add the imaginary parts, and it becomes the imaginary part of your answer. You put it times the i. And that is how you add complex numbers. And I will close off this video now. I'm typically going to be trying to make these videos about 10 minutes in length. In the next video, we will start to get into the geometry of complex arithmetic of complex addition in, in particular. We do want to focus on geometric interpretations in these videos. But that's the end of this first one.